Talk to you. Recorded live. Hello, this is Michael from Nothing But the Truth. It's December 29, 2014. And we're going to start out with the headlines from Yahoo.com. Our um, headline three, CBS News. 60 Minutes presents Inside the Vatican. Welcome to 60 Minutes presents tonight. I guess that would be yesterday. Uh, take a, uh, we take you inside the Vatican, where Marley or Morley Schaefer explores some of the treasures, secrets, and surprises of the Vatican Library. But we'll begin with Pope Francis, who made history, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that was Article Three, Article Five. Diocese Bishop at Wheel in Fatal Hit and Run. The female, the first female bishop at the Episcopal Diocese of Maryland was the driver in a hit and run crash that killed a bicyclist. Hmm. Interesting, I think. Let's see what we else. It's, it's going to be slow this week, folks, because of you know it's the holidays, the holy days, if you will. Um, of course, a lot of stuff about cops shooting or police officers shooting by folks. There's one here, uh, of course, dealing with uh, New York, and um, let's see. We to find one more article. And it is very slow. And it's only expected this time of year. And then I'll introduce you to the folks, the guests that we have. And it's extremely slow. Okay, Pope Francis expected to instruct one billion Catholics to act on climate change. Well, imagine that. So anyways... Uh, well, once again, we have another uh, episode of Conversation with Jugular 66, and Tom Press has agreed to join us in the conversation. And so, York, how are you doing? I'm very, very fine, and uh, so excited the last days in preparation of this broadcast, even though it's the second time that we do it because of the unaudibility last time that we recorded this. Now we have uh, Tom Press with us, and uh, we'll have an even deeper insight than we uh, shared with our listeners the first time that we did that, and uh, really makes me feel very, very good. Thank you very much. Yeah, hey, Tom, I'm, I'm okay. Um, just hanging in there. <laughs> I, um, Tom, are you there? Uh, you still there? Yes, yes, I, I'm here. Nice okay. to be with you, and anxious to get started. Okay, here we go, folks. Then we got Tom and 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 York here, and we're gonna try to redo or re re-record. Uh, last week's episode that was disastrous as far as the audio went. So, uh, I'll let I'll let uh, York take it away. Frank, go ahead. Okay. So we are back on the topic uh, discussing the 26 characteristics of Antichrist as uh, as described in the on a web page on the uh, website of remnantofgod.org. So for everybody to listen in and who wants to follow a little bit of the reading here, uh, you have to go to the website uh, www.remnantofgod.org and then I have to say uh, almost uh, look for the data because the exact link I just have copied in. So it's um, uh, dash 666 minus char.htm number 5. Um, anyway, I think in one of our earlier broadcasts, Michael already provided the link on that site, so you can follow it. It's, it's still I, in the chat room, by the way. I just put it back in the chat room. So. Ah, okay. It's in the chat room. I, I have no access to the chat room yet, so um, that's why I wasn't aware of that. Okay, so anybody can uh, click on that and then follow the reading. And um, a little bit of the same explanation like I did the first time, what is my motivation to talk about this? It's because uh, we all have to know um, who our adversary is, who the Antichrist is. And Tom did a wonderful reading on another talk show site with uh, Walt Stickel when he read the book Romanism and the Reformation. That is, and that is my personal opinion. Um, 
next to the Bible, the second most important book that any Christian should read. Uh, because there also it is absolutely made clear uh, on the basis of Bible prophecy who the Antichrist is. So this whole speculation about it's Obama, it's Prince Charles, it's Prince Henry, it's uh, a Muslim leader, it's whatever, uh, all these speculations uh, go up in fire and smoke when you start reading, of course, the Bible and understand it, and second of all, when you read the book Romanism and the Reformation. But still there are uh, people who aren't sure about this. So this uh, reading here shall give you a, a little bit of more. Yeah, that's my beard, I guess. <laughs> um, should give you a little bit of more confidence in identifying the Antichrist. Um, so that's why we, we started this reading. And we have 26 points to go about. And in our first two broadcasts, we covered the first 11. And now we are going, uh, the first 10, now we are going on with number 11, that is uh, named Antichrist must be able to understand dark sentences of hell. So I will be reading this part, and uh, I ask Tom that any time while the reading, when he has something uh, urgent to say, and, and to, that, to interrupt me, and uh, if he doesn't, then we will discuss this point afterwards to give even more clearance to what is written there. So I hope the sound now is okay. Can I can't do any better than this because this cable is hanging and every time I touch the cable it makes a sound and uh, I hope the sound is okay now. So, uh, does it work for you, Tom, the sound? Uh, there's still a lot of uh, a noise. It sounds like a cable being moved around. I'm not sure where it's coming from, but uh, uh, you, need, you need to be close to that microphone, however, because when you move it away, uh, you get very distant. Okay, how's that? Okay, well, let's go with that. Okay, I try to keep my head still while reading. <laughs> okay, um, characteristic number 11 of identifying, identifying the Antichrist is, uh, as I said, Antichrist must be able to understand dark sentences of hell. Um, why is that the title of it? Because when you read Daniel 8, verse 23, it reads, quote, And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up, end quote. It has been said time and time again that the Vatican has always been the place on earth that hell can be glorified or put in the light that is acceptable to man. Mixing paganism with Christianity proves this rather easily. Where else on earth can you see open satanic rituals being performed, yet at the same time be called Christianity? The Vatican has single-handedly been able to make Christians the world over accept graphic neo-pagan rituals as 100% acceptable. But this is not the main issue by which the prophecy is fulfilled. These dark sentences, or dark speech, is something only found in two places on earth, the Roman Catholic Church for one and the Satanic Church on the other. These two entities agree on many things. Both have priests and, uh, and operate in a hierarchy. Both have these priests wear black robes. Both chant. Both the Vatican and the Satanic Church use crucifixes. An empty cross is bad enough, seeing how it is a symbol of death. But the Vatican, like Satan's church, use a cross with a dead Jesus upon it. Both the Vatican and the Satanic Church invert or turn their crosses upside down. We all know of the satanic upside-down cross by merely looking at a few album covers of such rock bands as Slayer, Metallica, Black Sabbath, or Marilyn Manson. But were you aware the Pope displays the inverted cross as well? The Pope sits on an altar in Chorazim in Israel. The backdrop depicts a Christ drenched with pagan symbolism as well as an open book with a Latin title that translated reads, Love your enemies, I will come soon. Truth is, the Bible choice as children, <coughs> the biblical choice as children of God should be to proclaim, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. To preach, love your enemies alone with a prophetic statement, I will come again soon, is to preach we must concentrate on our relationship with each other <coughs> uh, over and above our relationship with the Lord. And as we all know, this is the main agenda of Rome at this time. They need to generate a global group hug so as to fill the one world church that the Pope becomes the leader of on June 26, 2000. 
Now he's speaking a little bit about the pictures that are provided uh, in the article, so when you have the article along you, it will make more sense. Notice the inverted cross of the satanic church that is very apparent on the throne of the beast power itself in these pictures. Why an inverted cross in the Holy Land, you ask? It is a satanic show of force unto the kingdom of heaven. Is not the beast himself proclaiming his so-called victory with such an open and blunt sign as an inverted cross in the land that Jesus himself walked 2,000 years ago? This is actually typical for the devil, for I am sure that this same satanic boldness was mustered the very day Rome placed the sign Jesus King of the Jews above the head of our Savior on the cross to mock him. As we all know, that too was a so-called victory for Satan with the help of Rome. And as well, uh, and as we also know, Satan was rudely awakened three days later when our Lord and Savior was miraculously awakened from that tomb. Just like back then, the devil is setting himself and all who follow him up for a deadly fall. For as surely as Jesus Christ arose from the tomb to prove Satan's so-called victory a lie, Matthew 24, verse 30, tells us that soon, quote, shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. End quote. But just how bad is it in the Vatican? The prophecy states, they will under understand dark sentences. So, do they? How is Satanism discovered in the Vatican? We read from Sunday, February 28, 1999, the subject Satanism is practiced in the Vatican, from uh, a website that is called www.fatima.org.news, two eminent churchmen declare Satanism is practiced in the Vatican. In recent weeks, a firestorm has been raging in Italy. The controversy revolves about, around the statements Archbishop Emmanuel Milingo, who made formal allegations that satanic activity is taking place inside the Vatican. When questioned by the Italian press about the allegations, he said that he stood by them. The Archbishop chose the, two, uh, the Fatima 2000 International Congress on World Peace, held in Rome in November 1996, hosted by the Fatima Crusader magazine, as a platform to first make these allegations public. There are also news of animal sacrifice in the Catholic Mass. Human Life International reported yesterday that some South Africans are calling for ancestor worship and animal sacrifices to be included in the liturgy of the Mass. According to Archbishop Beauty Tungali from Bloemfontein, uh, plans to include African pagan rit rites during the Mass is in response to the Vatican's invitation to inculturate Catholic rites. Hearing that both priests and lay people were making such plans, an outraged Father Richard Welsh, president of Human Life International, steamed, quote, In the letter to the Hebrews, St. Paul discussed the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross with the following words, For it is impossible that with the blood of oxen and goats sin should be taken away. Sacrifice and oblation thou would not. Behold, I come. He takes away the first, that he may establish that which follows. We are sanctified by the oblation of the body of Christ once. End quote by Thomas Horn from worldnews.com. Need I mention that doctrines of demons and traditions of men running rampant in the dogma of Roman Catholicism? Need I report on every aspect of evil in this church that has historically allowed the gates of hell to prevail against, as it, uh, it has open evidence that Jesus Christ would not, uh, could not have possibly started this church. Need I mention that now over 2,800 pages of documented evidence I, know have, um, I, have, I now have online on this website? If I had only a few pages on my site, I could understand some of the hate mail I receive on a regular basis that says all my facts are bogus but the site has almost 3,000 pages of well-documented facts that anyone can backtrack or research for themselves. By the way, did you notice in the previous article that Archbishop of Melingo chose Fatima 2000 International Congress to make known what was happening inside the walls of Rome? 
He knew that a global audience would be the result would be the result if he waited until then to uncover what he witnessed. Honestly, I'm surprised this man wasn't murdered for exposing the Vatican so boldly. And that finishes our first characteristic of the Antichrist for today. Now, I'd like to hear Tom's remarks on this, and I also have some if he doesn't uh, feature them first. So, please, Tom, share your thoughts on this one I just read with us, please. Well, I would just begin by saying that uh, uh, it's it's hard to really add anything uh, to Nicholas's comments here in this article. He is the most thorough, the most comprehensive researcher uh, on the internet with regard to the Vatican, and uh, he is very, very thorough and comprehensive. Um, some would say long-winded, but he doesn't repeat himself. He, he, he literally uh, compiles uh, almost all the information that's available to prove that this passage referring to the Antichrist, one of the characteristics of Antichrist, is that he understands dark sentences. Uh, Nicholas is to be applauded. And uh, so being as hard as it is to add anything, I do have a few additions to what he said. And that is that in the the book written by a, a Jesuit priest, Malachi Martin, many of you might be familiar with his name, He wrote a book, a best-selling book, entitled The Keys of This Blood. And in that book, uh, and I won't give a synopsis of the entire book, but it puts forth the uh, reality that there will be a a quote-unquote new world order. And the only question yet to be settled is whether the new world order will be run by the United States or the Soviet Union, or Russia, as it were, or the Vatican. And uh, Malachi Martin says the New World Order will be run by the Vatican. It's a three-way contest. Uh, He says not a question of whether or not there will be a New World Order. The only question remaining is is who will be in charge of it. And uh, he he clearly states uh, that the Vatican is the hands-down winner in this race for control of this global uh, government. And uh, he also says in the same book that Luciferianism or Satanism is openly practiced in the Vatican. They don't even take steps, measures to conceal the fact. Now, I'm personally not Uh, privy to what goes on at the Vatican. I don't have an insider at the Vatican. Uh, But I think we could trust Malachi Martin, who was was, uh, one of the principals of the the Gregorian University at the Vatican. He was a Vatican insider for decades. And uh, he's very well respected as an author in the Roman Catholic Church. And he plainly says uh, the Vatican... Is it practices open Luciferian rituals on the high altar at the Vatican, and it, of course it's got it's gotten many Roman Catholics uh, in a quandary. What do they do? It appears that Satan has taken over the church, and many Roman Catholics are leaving the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, they're they're incensed about not only the priest pedophilia pandemic in the world, but they're even more incensed that the Vatican tried to cover it up and, uh, and, and literally, made, uh, vict- literally made victims of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the victims in the matter. In other words, they turned their uh, efforts toward discrediting the accusers of these pedophile priests instead of instead of uh you know making reparations or somehow trying to look the bottom line is the people in the Roman Catholic Church want these pedophiles out of the church 
Well, the Vatican has yet not acted. And, in, and more than that, the Vatican tries to protect these priests, still trying to protect them from civ- the civil power, civil, leg- uh, civil prosecution, and, and holding it as a private matter for the church to be dealt with by the Vatican. Oh, and, so, of course, so, the, Vatican, the Vatican simply, simply protect, moves the priest from one diocese to the next, one, one archdiocese to the next, or even literally taking them out of the country and putting them in another country. And if they still, if they still uh, offend little children, they simply put them up in the Vatican. Can they're, I never, the they're never brought to justice. Go ahead, Yerk. Yeah, something uh, very interesting just crossed my mind. You know that I live in Belgium. And here in Belgium, we had a scandal around 19, I don't know anymore, 1994. 1905, 96, with a guy called Marc Dutroux. Maybe you over there in America heard of this. And Marc Dutroux was um, um, put into jail because he surely killed four children that he had in his, uh, in his cellar, in his basement, in his house here in the south of Belgium, in, uh, uh, close to a town that is called Neuf Chateau the new castle, if you translate that into English, and that he was uh, doing this for a pedophile ring was always suppressed. Um, when the thing came to the court, 27 witnesses were missing, missing by, um, they were, if you want to say it like that, they were uh, suicided, most of them, or openly killed others, 27 witnesses. And also his wife was in there. So eventually, Mark Dutroux and his wife got sentenced uh, to years of prison. But his wife first came out to be released and, get this, she put herself under canon law and went to a monastery because like this, she could continue her life without being persecuted by the civil authorities. Yes, that's, that's the, the way they operate. And that is a prime example of something that Tom just read. And, uh, well, this affects me, of course, because I live here in Belgium, and I have lived in Belgium in that time that this Mark True thing uh, started. And um, the, the ways that he was working for other people that were not... Uh, researched at that time because it was um, pro- he, because he was protected. Well, someone might ask, well, what does the global priest pedophilia pandemic have to do with the characteristic of Antichrist that he will understand dark sentences? I, I simply maintain that uh, the the debauchery of little children is a satanic ritual. And that's what Malachi Martin called it. And it's, the Bible confirms that they worship the dragon. The Bible says they will worship the dragon. Well, there can be no mistake about who the dragon is in Scripture. It's Satan himself. And this is confirmed by Malachi Martin and the, the bishop that Nicholas mentioned in his article. And I also have a quote from uh, P.D. Stewart's book, uh, Mystery Babylon, or ra- rather, uh, the, uh, uh, the title of the book is uh, Antichrist is a Woman Alive and Well Again, and I highly recommend it. It's a two-book series. Uh, uh, the, other, the title of the other book escapes me right now, but it's P.D. Stewart, and it's available online. You can order the book. But in that book, Antichrist is a woman alive and well again. Now, it's a woman speaking of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, which is just exactly how it's referred to in Revelation chapter 17 as the woman who rides a scarlet-colored beast. That's who he's speaking about, the Roman Catholic Church. He says in that book that at the Jesuit University in San Francisco, the most frequent guest speaker at that Jesuit university is Anton LaVey of the Church of Satan. And, of course, uh, 
you know, the question is often asked, why does a so-called Christian university invite uh, the, the, uh, the high priest of Satanism in this country to come speak to the, to the students? And the explanation is that there's no law of the church that says they can't, they can't study uh, the, uh, the uh, what is the word they use, the techniques of Satan. And that they they study literally Satanism through Anton LaVey and then use it for the church. It's an open admission. Now now people would say, Well why would they admit such a thing? I think they're proud of it. I think the Roman Catholic Church is proud of it. It certainly is consistent with what Malachi Martin said. It certainly is consistent with what the other archbishop said. Malingo, I believe, is the name of the man. Archbishop Malingo said the same thing. And 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 while Roman Catholics will recoil from the accusation when a Protestant or a non-Roman Catholic makes it, they deal with it secretly. They know it's true. They're, they're disgusted with the Roman Catholic Church. And, uh, you know, it might be beyond the scope of this discussion, but I think this is a prime time in world history to proselytize Roman Catholics. Uh, there's many in the Roman Catholic Church that if it weren't for the fact that from cradle to grave they are, in, they are indoctrinated with this idea that the Roman Catholic Church is is the only Christian church on the planet, and all else are heretics, they would leave the Roman Catholic Church in droves. And uh, I think it's it's you know it's it's time for us to speak openly about these things and not apologize for pointing out the dark sentences that is understood and practiced. In in in, in uh, the Roman Catholic Church, here we have the first Jesuit pope in world history, at least the only open Jesuit pope of history, throwing open the Roman Catholic Church doors to atheists. He did it publicly. It's beyond debate. So so has not the Roman Catholic Church, as predicted in the scriptures? Exchange light for darkness and darkness for light. I mean, it, it, this uh, you know this is even understood by Roman Catholics. It, it's not. It's way beyond debate. The Roman Catholic Church in this late date is exposing its true nature and glorying in it. Absolutely. And, and, you know, uh, yes, I, go ahead, I think, I think um, it has to do that uh, with the point that the Roman Catholic Church actually takes takes an account that people are ignorant today. Um, a few weeks before this holiday she started, the Belgian uh, newspapers were full of another scandal of pedophilia within the Roman Catholic Church here in Belgium, and it even made the first pages of the papers. But there's never, never, ever any follow-up to this. So they publish this uh, day or maybe even a week, I don't care, but there's no uprising from the people. There's no uprising from the lay sheep that visit this church. And I think that the Roman Catholic Church actually um, abuses this, um, yeah, can you call it ignorance by the people? They read about it and they put it aside because there are other things to read and they are more interesting than this. And they say, oh, it will all go away. I can do nothing. I, I, I myself am too small to protest or, or, or do whatever. And, and they just don't do it anymore. And I think the Roman Catholic Church really takes this ignorance that they have put in the world by their indoctrination uh, with a lot of people a lifelong time um, and they really take that into account when they do these things and then show it openly to the people. Yes, it reminds me of some videos that I watched on YouTube not long ago, interviews of a man, uh, a Roman Catholic canon lawyer, 
His name was Tom Forrest, as I recall. And uh, he has taken many of these priest pedophile cases to the Roman Catholic Church. And he is incensed that the Vatican has a secret policy to cover up the, 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 the pedophile crimes of these priests and to then victimize the victims and turn the attention of the Roman Catholic Church against these sufferers of the, of the priests. And uh, he knows you can just look at his body language and listen to his speeches on, on YouTube videos. Tom Forrest, just, just go and type in his name and watch his body language and his, and, and his speech, and you'll come to no other conclusion that he knows there's something terribly wrong at, at the Vatican. And uh, that, that Satan has literally, <clears throat> you know, just like Malachi Martin said, the smoke of Satan has entered the sanctuary. I believe though he quoted a, a pope. If I'm not mistaken, I think it was Pope Paul the Sixth. Uh, yes, Pope Paul the Sixth. And uh, uh, literally, the papacy is look. I mean, I'm just going to speak in plain terms that even an ignoramus can understand. The papacy is the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist of Scripture. He is not the vicar of Christ. He is the vicar of Satan himself. He claims all of the attributes of Christ. He claims the prerogatives of Christ. He claims Christ's throne. He calls himself the vicar of Christ. And yet he serves Satan. The the Bible plainly tells us that they worship the dragon. This is confirmed by the highest ranking officials in the in the College of Cardinals. Jesuit priests admitted, named Jesuit priests, like the Jesuit priest Peter DeRosa in, in his book, uh, uh, what is the name of the book? I'm having trouble today. Uh, Vickers of Christ, the dark side of the papacy. He literally rehearses the entire history of the of the papacy. And and one can hardly read that book without getting sick to one's stomach. The 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 unspeakable crimes of the papacy throughout all of history, all of its history is marked with satanic crimes. And it's written by a Jesuit priest. I mean, this isn't a book written by a Protestant. This is a book written by a Vatican insider from the most, the most powerful Roman Catholic order of priests on the planet. And he exposes the dark sentences of the papacy. And uh, like I say, it, it's, it's uh, Nicholas of remnantofgod.org is so comprehensive in his research it, it's hard to add anything, but there are things to add. The, the information is so voluminous about the, the satanic nature of the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church that it, it's hard to cover it all. And it's not even denied by the Roman Catholic Church. Now, poor Roman Catholics are faced, to, faced with these accusations and assertions by Protestants and they recoil and defense and make counter charges, but after they're done trying to discredit their Protestant accusers, they have to deal with the accusers of their own church, which have become legion. And uh, it's time for the world to deal with the cosmic criminality of the Roman Catholic Church and ask the question, Where does the papacy get its authority? Where does the papacy get a carte blanche uh, uh, pass to terrorize the world for 2,000 years? And who does it serve? 
that that answer should be glaringly obvious to anybody who spent a modicum of time investigating the papacy. And uh, the dark sentences, well, but right. the dark sentences as opposed to understanding of light. And where do we get the light? We get it from the scriptures and the scriptures only. And these these understandings, these practices uh, are darkness that come from the papacy. Where do they get it? From the prince of darkness. So uh, it's, it's, it's one of the positively identifying characteristics uh, of, the bat, of the papacy. Understanding dark sentences. Understanding sentences sayings from Satan himself. So, back to you, Eric. Yeah, that's absolutely right what you just said there, uh, Tom. The point is that the Roman Catholic Church always has put the Bible aside, and most of the Catholics today haven't even read the Bible because they get their knowledge from the Roman Catholic Catechism. And there, of course, all this stuff is not known. The Roman Catholic Church does not um, uh, promote to their members to read the Bible. And if they do so, they write their own Bibles, like the NIV, and I don't know, all these modern versions of the Bible that have all been corrupted uh, by, by, by Jesuitism. Where links that are taken away, but where links that uh, are certainly can be made when you read the King James Bible, uh, are taken out of, like um, uh, that Jesus was uh, God in the flesh, something that you can understand when you read the Bible, the KGB, but something that you don't understand when you read the NIV or other versions like this. And um, they have always uh, tried to suppress the Bible and. Uh, to my knowledge, most of the Roman Catholics don't even know the Bible. They just go by the catechism. And that is what's written in the Bible. Don't believe any man will take the scripture. And the catechism is written by men and not by God. Yes, and while you were speaking, I remembered the title of that two-book series by P.D. Stewart. It's a must-read, <clears throat> an absolute must-read it's called Code Word Barbalon. And I'll spell the second word, B-A-R-B-E-L-O-N. Code Word Barbalon. It's a two-book series, and uh, I highly recommend both books. And uh, you'll understand from reading those books that the scriptures, the scriptures are speaking specifically of the papacy in these regards. If you if you if if there was anyone with a shred of doubt who the Antichrist is, uh, there will be no doubt by the time they finish reading those two books, backed up by Scripture and history. It's a no-brainer. And and the real the real hideous reality is that Christians today have been led to believe a lie that the Antichrist is not an institution that has dominated the whole Christian era, the papacy, but that the Antichrist is a single individual that comes on the world scene just before Christ's return. And most Christians believe that lie. And so they cannot comprehend or will not comprehend the role of the papacy as the antichrist of the Bible all throughout history. And uh, it's called futurism. And the correct understanding of the Bible is, is called historicism. The book of Revelation, the prophetical books, especially the book of Revelation, lays out the history of Christianity from its beginning to its end when Christ returns. It's, 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 it's not all to be fulfilled in the future. It has been in the fulfilling over the last 2,000 years. 
And it describes in clear, colorful language what role the papacy has played throughout that entire 2,000-year history. And when it's understood in that context, and when the fulfillment of those prophecies are seen in history, and they are seen in history if we'll just comprehend the history that's available, then, then we come to the conclusion that this Antichrist, this papacy, truly is the Antichrist of the Bible, and it understands dark sentences, sentences from hell. They worship the dragon. And so I'm repeating myself now, but uh, I find the, the repetition necessary because of the, the, what has now become the orthodox belief in, in, in the Christian world, that Antichrist is just a single individual that has not yet appeared upon the world, and really uh, Christians don't need to be concerned about the Antichrist. They believe they're going to be raptured out before he arrives, and uh, it's all a lie, every bit of it. And the Protestant report. look, I want to ask your listeners uh, uh, to do one thing. Just simply go to Wikipedia or any other online encyclopedia and type in the word Protestantism and read it to its end. Read and understand what it says about Protestantism. And you'll clearly understand that the churches of today, no matter what denomination, have abandoned the beliefs of the Protestant Reformation. And generally speaking, because they have abandoned the very foundational beliefs of the Protestant Reformers, there's almost no Protestantism left in the country, or in the world for that matter. And because of the that lack of understanding of who the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist is. The Antichrist can just simply do whatever it wants in the world today. It's considered to be a Christian institution, when literally it is a satanic institution. And anyone who calls himself a Christian that doesn't know this has been deceived lock, stock, and barrel, deceived. And the consequences of that deception are unspeakable. And we're about to see in this country, the United States of America, the bloody, bitter consequences of the failure to recognize who the Antichrist is, failure to understand that it is the papacy of the Roman Catholic Church, failure to understand that it does not worship Jesus, it does not worship the Creator. It worships his nemesis, the dragon. And, uh, and once one comprehends this, then one has to come to the immediate conclusion that the, the so-called ecumenical movement is simply a movement to put all of those who used to protest Antichrist, the Protestants, to put them back under the authority, not of Christ, but of Antichrist, the papacy. And that is the most hideous reality that one can imagine. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, you made a very good point there. You know, when you go out on the streets over there in the United States of America and you ask any citizen that you walk by, um, is the United States of America a Protestant country? They would say yes. But there are only very few, I think, when you ask them, so what are you protesting? They have forgotten what the protest was all about. Most of the people do not even know about Luther, who really kicked the Reformation into first, second, and third gear, let's say at least here in Europe, and started that whole movement, let's call it, with the 
Conceal of Spire that we talked about in another broadcast of 1529 when the word Protestant first was used. So people know that they are a Protestant country, but they don't know what they are protesting against anymore. And I'm quite sure that when you tell them what they should protest, they say, why should we protest the Holy Father? Yeah. And that is just confirmation of how well the Roman Catholic Church and the affiliated Jesuits and other monasteries, orders and whatever did work throughout the last centuries to dump the people down to a state that they call themselves Protestants and they have no idea what they are protesting. And let me tell you this, it is not only for Americans. Also here in Europe, we have Protestant Protestant churches in, in Germany, it's called uh, the Evangelical Church, uh, which is the opposite to the Roman Catholic Church. And I think that even when you ask people over there, they have no idea what they are protesting against. Because otherwise they would protest and they don't. Because all these denominations nowadays are completely and 100% infiltrated by Jesuits. They all teach spiritual exercises in their seminaries. And they all teach spiritual formation during their sermons, masses, and whatever they do. And people do not recognize this. No, I, I tell you, uh, they completely replaced the Bible with all of these so-called visualizations and uh, and uh, spiritual formation. That none of it is scriptural; it's all satanic, and uh, it's it's being taught in all the churches today. It's just unbelievable the the apostasy that reigns in the churches in this country. And here we have already scheduled this coming fall this uh, upcoming fall uh, Pope Francis I I will be accurate in saying Antichrist Francis I is coming to the United States and is going to address our Congress now our Constitution if, 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 that, is, if that is alone the basis would it demands a separation of church and state. It demands a separation of church and state. It also demands that there be no establishment of a particular religion in this country. And here we have not only the presidents of the United States flying to Rome and having private meetings with the Antichrist of the Bible, but we have the Antichrist coming here to address our Congress. It's all a violation of the separation clause and the non-establishment clause of our Constitution. Never mind the Bible. But what, 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 what consort is there between righteousness and unrighteousness? What fellowship is there between Christ and Baal? Christ and Antichrist. And were there a shred of Protestantism left in the United States of America? There would be protests in the streets all over this country demanding that the papacy cancel its plans to come to this country and address our Congress. That Congress is of, by, and for the people of this country. We are the governors of this land. And the papacy should never have an audience in that portion of our government that is to represent the people. That's what the Congress is all about, to represent the people. And what could they learn from the Antichrist of the Bible? What authority should the Antichrist of the Bible have in our constitution in our constitutional Congress? <clears throat> Something is wrong in Washington, D.C. The Catholics are openly saying that there's something wrong in the Vatican. And that something that's wrong in the Vatican presumes 
to come to this country and speak to our Congress. Where is the protest? Where is the protest? There isn't any. Well, that's why you had this um, sermon from uh, Kenneth Copeland together with his Bishop Tony Palmer about explaining why the protest is over. And uh, I made a video on that on my channel, Jogma 66, uh, titled One World Religion, Protest is Over, question mark. And uh, I really advise you to watch that video and go into the description box and click on the links that I provided in there, and that will give you an even better understanding of that. I thank you very much, Tom, for your insight in, in, in this part, and uh, I sure, uh, I'm sure you will have uh, even anything more to say. But before we go on on this one point that you have now very deeply explained to all our listeners, I want to bring something else up that was mentioned in this article. And that is, quote, we all know of a satanic upside down cross by merely looking at a few album covers of such rock bands as Slayer, Metallica, Black Sabbath, or Marilyn Manson, end quote. There is a documentary out on YouTube that you can watch that is called They Sold Their Souls for Rock and Roll. I think when you have all parts of this, uh, 20, 30, 40 parts, I don't know, of 10 minutes to 15 minutes, and really exposing not only the, men, the groups mentioned here, Slayer, Metallica, Black Sabbath, Marilyn Manson, but also groups like the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, um, and a lot of others that just don't come to my mind right now. And these music bands are used, of course, to indoctrinate the children and the youth. And yeah, they, they glamorize hell. They glamorize yeah. Lu- Satan. They call him Lucifer. They don't accept it, that, that God cast him out of heaven and changed his name to, to uh, Satan. And they worship him, just like in the Roman Catholic Church. And the upside-down cross is one of their identifying icons of this, this satanic worship. And it's even displayed by the Vatican. This, this brings us to the, the, to the, uh, the, the, the uh, shepherd's crook that the papacy carries, this hideous uh, representation of, of Christ on the cross. It's called the bent and broken cross. And it was used by Satanists all throughout history since the since the uh, seventh century to, to to designate the Antichrist. And here, the papacy fashions the papal crozier, they call it the papal staff, that that ornate uh, walking stick that the Pope carries with that very image on it. It's an open display of its veneration of Satan. They don't even try to hide it. And it's displayed in the, the, these evil, wicked, satanic rock groups. They're all on the same page. The only ones who are ignorant about all this are God's people. And they're so uh, lethargic, spiritually lethargic, so scripturally uh, inept, illiterate, and so busy with the world that they don't see what's happening under, under their very noses. It's incredible the apostasy uh, that has, has, has enveloped the Christian world today. And uh, Dark Sentences doesn't even describe it. Well, that's right. And um, I think uh, we made a very clear point what it's all about. There's Dark Sentences right now, and I would go uh, now to characteristic number 12 of the identification of Antichrist is that Antichrist declares Jesus has not come in the flesh. 1 John, or 1 John uh, 4 verse 3 reads, quote, And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. End quote. The word is plain here. If the church proclaims that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh, then that church is of Antichrist. Many Catholics to this day fight me on this tooth and nail. 
They proclaim that church does say that Jesus came in the flesh. But does this church really say Jesus came in the flesh? Notice an actual excerpt from the Roman Catholic Catechism. Quote, quote, Through the centuries, the church has become ever more aware that Mary, quote, unquote, full of grace, through God, was redeemed from the moment of her conception. That is what the dogma of the Immaculate Conception confesses, as Pope Pius IX proclaimed in 1854. The most blessed Virgin Mary was, from the first moment of her conception, by a singular grace and privilege of Almighty God and by virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ, Savior of the human race, preserved immune from all stain of original sin. Pope Pius IX at Infabilis Deus, 1854. You can also verify this in the online version of the Catechism book at the Vatican website in the Original Sin section. Besides the fact they lie about Mary and her state of salvation, to declare that Jesus Christ has come to this world in the flesh other than the flesh the Roman Catholic Church teaches we beat is to preach that Jesus did not come in the flesh. They say he came in the flesh not stained with the stain we supposedly bear. To say Jesus is not, uh, did not have in his flesh what we have in ours is to say he did not come in our flesh. Therefore, he cannot possibly be the same Jesus John spoke of in 1 John 4, verse 3. The Roman Catholic Jesus is not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of Rome cheated and prevented his flesh from being stained with what Rome calls so-called original sin. But what is the definition of original sin according to Rome? Original sin is the sin we inherit from Adam, the father of the human race. That is from the Converse Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, page 41. According to Roman dogma, original sin is a sin we all inherit from Adam. Problem with uh, that is the Bible provides it to be a bold-faced lie, for it is written, Ezekiel 18, verse 20, quote, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, neither shall the Father bear the iniquity of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Unquote. The Word of God plainly states there is no such thing as original sin. What we are born with is the sinful nature. We choose to sin when we come to the age of accountability. Jesus was also born with a sinful nature. Difference was he chose not to sin. That's the end of um, this point that I was reading. And um, it is not only here stated that uh, Jesus has not come in the flesh, but there is also this putting Mary above Jesus, which is another part of the uh, wrong teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, of course. When they speak about... Um, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary, from the first moment of her conception by a singular grace, privilege of Almighty God, and by virtue of the merit of Jesus Christ. I mean, they put Mary, the mother, above God. Tom. Yes, and they also say that Jesus participated, or rather Mary, participa participated in our redemption with Jesus. Uh, eventually, it's going to become a dogma in the Roman Catholic Church that Mary is our Savior. It was uh, that Jesus got his sinless nature, his immaculate nature, from his mother. And the Roman Catholic Church currently teaches that Mary was there at the cross, and she suffered even more than Jesus and it is by her suffering that Roman Catholics are saved. That's already the current teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. So why do they need Jesus in the first place? Also in the Roman Catholic Church, they are taught to believe that once consecrated by the priest, that the, the Eucharist or the, the host, the round wafer of bread, <clears throat> held up and, and blessed and consecrated by the priest, 
becomes the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity uh, of Jesus Christ. It is the flesh of Jesus Christ, and it's offered once again on the altar of the Roman Catholic Church as a sacrifice. It's called a sacrifice. It's called a victim. And that becomes the flesh of the Roman Catholic Savior, that piece of bread. Now, uh, this may sound outrageous to those who've never heard it before, but all you have to do is watch the official Roman Catholic channel on television, EWTN, Eternal Eternal uh, Word Television Network, EWTN. And uh, they will confirm what the Eucharist is. A piece of bread becomes a sacrifice. And it literally puts what Jesus did on the cross as uh, something in the long distance past. It takes away the significance of what Jesus did once and for all for the redemption of man and places it in the context of a continual sacrifice that must be made every day by the Roman Catholic priest. And that through that sacrifice on the altar of the Roman Catholic Church, Roman Catholics are saved, or rather, grace is infused, whatever that means. They've twisted the scriptures. But let me tell you something even more significant. Pope John Paul II is quoted in writing as saying, Jesus did not come to be the Messiah. Jesus came to show the Christ in every man. That is a direct quote from from Pope John Paul II, or rather, Antichrist John Paul II. And you'll find that quote on a website, if you're ready to copy, www.mostholyfamilymonastery.com. Mostholyfamilymonastery.com. That is a website that is written by two... Uh, uh, Roman Catholic brothers, and they are of the traditional Roman Catholic faith. In other words, they believe that the Mass should be said in Latin, okay, and that Roman Catholic canon law is the law of the world, and that Protestants are heretics, and it's no sin to kill a heretic. They are the traditionalists, I call them the Tridentine Roman Catholic. They, they, they uh, ascribe to the ancient Roman Catholic Latin rites. And uh, they're traditionalists. They're regarded as traditionalists among Roman Catholics, or Tridentine Roman Catholics. And uh, they are of the the portion of the Roman Catholic Church that is believed by Protestants to be long dead and gone. They're the ones who would burn Protestants at the stake. They make no bones about their hatred of Protestants, the rebellion of the Protestant Reformation, and that uh, they, they should be given three warnings to come back to the Roman Catholic Church, and then after that be killed. And uh, they represent a large segment of the Roman Catholic faith, the Tridentines, or the traditionalist Roman Catholics. And they regard every pope since, uh, I believe it is uh, Pope, uh, pope Paul VI, every pope from Pope Paul VI to be antichrists. In other words, popes that have embrace the ecumenical movement to unite all the world's religions, that their intent is to pollute and eventually destroy the Roman Catholic Church when we know it's always been the, the, uh, uh, the purpose or the intent of the Roman Catholic Church to be eventually the one, the one religion that all men can find fellowship. That's why they call it the universal church. And this is why Catholics around the world are outraged at the direction that they see their church taking, embracing every heresy. And uh, But they quote, they show the document where 
John Paul II wrote, Jesus did not come to be the Messiah. Jesus came to show the Christ in every man. We're all Christ's. You know, it, it goes along with this, this idea of, of, uh, of uh, evolution. That man is, yes, that man is not only evolving physically, but man is evolving spiritually and has learned to stand erect on his back feet and now is, is evolving into what is taught by the Roman Catholic Church as becoming truly human. And, and that is simply the absence of the gospel, the absence of this belief that Jesus is the redeemer of the world or that man needs to be redeemed in the first place. And, of course, these, these, these brothers from MostHolyFamilyMonastery.com are absolutely correct when they call John Paul II an antichrist. They just fail to realize that every pope has been the antichrist of the Bible. And they, they worship in the synagogue of Satan. And, uh, uh, but uh, the Roman Catholic Church is, is finally coming out in the open with their rejection that Christ came in the flesh. And so while there may have in the past been doubts as to whether this charge actually fits the papacy, there can be hardly little uh, doubt now. And that's a fact. Uh, we have another uh, Canadian Roman Catholic priest. He, he, he won't admit that he's a Roman Catholic priest, but he wears a black cassock with a white collar and he's made great, uh, great. Uh, he, he's gathered up great support from Christians all over the world for his demands uh, and protest against the papacy for all the pedophilia that his, his name is. Uh, it'll come to me in a second. Um, he advertises. He's got many videos up on YouTube where he is in defense of the. Uh, Native, the Native Canadians, the, the Indians or the uh, 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 indigenous Canadian people, uh, children who were placed in state-run schools, which were run by the Jesuits in Canada. And over the year, over, over centuries, have made medical experimentation and and even thrown these babies in in burning ovens uh i I just can't say his name right now it'll come to me in a moment but i'll name him by name and i've spoken to the individual over the telephone he made a statement in one of his videos that there's no historical proof that any Jesus ever existed. And, and, I, and I rewound it, and I played it again. And that's exactly what he said, so I called him up on the phone. And I said, I, I, I just need some clarification. I was watching your videos. I'm supportive of what you do in defense of these children. And the, the, the crimes that have taken place in Canada at the hands of these Roman Catholic priests and these Jesuit priests... But you said that there were, there's no historical record that Jesus ever existed. And he said, that's absolutely right. That's what I said, and that's what I believe. There's, there's no historical record of Jesus. Kevin Annett is his name, Kevin Annett. And, and he is the most outspoken leader of an assault against these pedophile priests. They've even created a, 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 a court, a yeah, tribunal. Yeah, he, in, he in Belgium is. Yes. The ITCC, right? Yes, the ITCC. And, and, and until I, I, I was just stunned at what the man said in his video. And I called him and I asked him specifically and purposefully over the phone, what did you mean? We said, I meant just exactly what I said. There's no historical record that Jesus ever existed. And he calls himself a Christian. 
But look, that's the way the world is going. And Kevin Annett uh, has gotten all this support against these pedophile Roman Catholic priests and, and all this help for the victims and the survivors of... If you're not familiar with what has happened in Canada, under the auspices of government-run schools, you need to be aware of it. The hundreds and hundreds of children that have just completely disappeared from those schools. And Kevin Annett is running this this court system that they have developed to bring formal charges against the Queen of England and certain principles of, of the English government plus the Vatican and their hand and the Jesuits and all in their in their involvement in the destruction of all these native Canadian children. I was just, I thought he was a hero. I supported him. I I even had him as a guest on my program, Inquisition Update. Yet, he says, there's no proof that a Jesus ever existed in history. What what do I do with that? And uh, I've uh, I've since disfellowshipped with him. I'm praying for him. But uh, it, it's uh, this new world order is not going to accept Jesus as a historical figure, nor especially that he was the propitiation for our sins and our redemption to God. So it's going to be a Christless new world order religion, and the head of it is unquestionably going to be the papacy. It, it's uh, a hideous reality. I'll take a little break here. I'll be right back. Yeah, that's all right. I just want to add to this. When I first heard of this Kevin Annette and this ITCC, um, I was very vigilant about that. I had, I don't know how it is with you, Michael, but when you read something like this for the first time, then you always have some kind of a gut feeling with it, you know? I, I had a gut feeling that there's something not right about this because I thought, who is he to take on the most powerful man in the world, the Pope, uh, to put him or even others in front of any, any court? How, how can he even do that? I thought it was all a hoax. I, I didn't believe it was quite true. I don't know what your experience with Kevin and Evan or your knowledge of the fact. I mean, I know about him. We talked about him last show. Mm-hmm. And the inconsistency of, you know, how basically using the court system that's run by the Rome to actually prosecute Rome? Yeah. It's not, it's not, it's not going to happen, is it? It's, it's, another <laughs> attempt, it's another attempt to change the system from within the system. Or, or give the impression that that's yeah. what's happening. And the system can never be changed from within. It can only be changed or destroyed from without, and not from within. Yeah, it's it's a little bit like going back to our broadcast that we had on why didn't the reformers go all the way? All the reformers also came out of the Roman Catholic Church and they wanted to reform the church. In other words, they wanted to reform the synagogue of Satan. Right, this is an impossibility. You don't think it which is which is ridiculous when you think about it. Yeah, so that is why the reformat reformators didn't go all the way, probably. And we talked about that excessively about uh, the Sabbath question. And uh, if you haven't heard that yet, uh, if you're listening to this show, then uh, you should really look that up in our archives here on uh, Talk Show on Nothing But the Truth. Um, why didn't the reformers go all the way? That is a very interesting part. And it also deals with the fact that there is a big difference between the revolution and the rebellion where revolution just um, takes the existing structure that has been there before and just places other people in the same structure, whereas the rebellion tells, uh, tears the whole structure down and builds up from scratch, completely new. And uh, if you ask me, there could have never been a reformation of the Roman Catholic Church because it was, from the beginning, uh, an antichrist church. That's exactly right. It's irreformable. And any attempt to reform that church is going to end in disaster. It it serves its purpose in the world. 
to try the saints of God. And uh, it's Antichrist. It's God's will that it be in the world. And it's going to be his design to destroy it when he comes. And uh, it's up for us to prove our faith in Christ by protesting the Antichrist and informing the world of the diabolical role that it plays. Couldn't agree more. So I am about to start characteristic of the Antichrist number uh, 13. 13. 13. The Antichrist is to use craftiness and deceit in a major way. I just want to say before I start reading this, this goes about for five pages. So, Tom, when you uh, when I when I read something and you say, well, this is something that I want to interrupt because I want to go into more depth into this here, then maybe it's more interesting than you do that right when I'm reading and not wait until I have done. But that's up to you. I just say. Okay, I, I wouldn't mind being interrupted reading five pages in a while. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, characteristic number thirteen: the Antichrist is to use craftiness and deceit in a major way. I begin this with a quote from Daniel, uh, chapter 8, uh, verse 23 to 25. Quote, And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart. And by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hands. And there is Christ's return. And, and, and all these things are coming to pass right now. He understands dark sentences. We're talking about the papacy. And he used craftiness and deceit, the characteristics of his God, Satan, the most subtle of all foes of heaven, and craft and deceit is their expertise. And no more craftiness or deceit than is demonstrated even by the Eucharist, the celebration of the Mass, that somehow uh, the priest has the power when he consecrates the wafer to literally create his creator. That's what the priests bo- boast about doing, that the priests of the Roman Catholic Church have the power to create their creator and then offer him again as another sacrifice on the altar. You can't get more crafty or deceitful than that. And I'll just leave it at that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. Now for the people who don't understand uh, the word craft very well, it is explained in Strong's number 4820 as craft as deceit, deceitful, false, guile, feigned, subtlety, and treachery. So every time I mention the word craft, you can link it to the words that I've just read. Deceit and treachery, the most important ones. The popes of Rome have all along, uh, all along used craftiness and deceit to gain the upper hand. For example, the quote-unquote New World Order is now something that can be well verified first in Rome. Do an online search and notice all the articles online that pertain to this topic and were first suggested by Rome, and then agreed to by major governments. My February 1, 2004 Truth Provided radio broadcast is all about this fact. Rome's major prophetic desire is in, the fact, uh, is in fact the one world court and one world church system combined. The one world court started in 1999 and was ratified in the year 2000. This Roman international court carries the solar wheel logo of the Vatican itself on its website as well as its letterhead. The Pope is in fact its globally accepted elected leader. The One World Church began on June 26, 2000. In fact, the papers were signed to bring to life the United Religions Initiative in the same hotel room and the same date of June 26 as back in 1948 when they created the United Nations. Truth is, the Pope was considered the elected leader of this church a year in advance, and when it came to be in 2000, he stepped in victorious. Now, follows a little article that is taken from the Electronic Telegraph, UK, 
News, May 13, 1999. Churches agree that the Pope has overall authority. The Pope was recognized as the overall authority in the Christian world by an Anglican and Roman Catholic commission yesterday, which described him as, quote, gift to, uh, to be received by all the churches, unquote. If a new united Christian church was created, it would be the Bishop of Rome who would exercise a universal premise. The 43-page document, The Gift of Authority, has been produced by the 18 members, uh, 18 member Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission after five years of debate. The Commission concluded that the Bishop of Rome had a, quote, specific ministry concerning the discernment of truth, unquote, and accepted that only the Pope had the moral authority to unite the various Christian denominations. Mark Birchall, a member of the Church of England Evangelical Council, said, it speaks as if the Bishop of Rome has always been on the side of the angels, while it is, while it is well known that for several centuries past the Bishop of Rome was certainly not. The R.T. Reverend Cormac Murphy O'Connor, Bishop of Arundel and Brighton, and the other co-chairman added, the primacy of the Pope is a gift to be shared. This evil entity, so that was the end of the quote from the uh, <coughs> Electron Telegraph. This evil entity in Rome has hoodwinked all the governments and churches of the planet into thinking it's a good thing to do as she desires. Prophecy declared they would create these evil governing entities for peace and safety, when in fact it is opposite of their desires all along. Rome is actually setting everyone on earth up for a major fall. Don't be fooled. They are not concerned with your faith, nor are they concerned with your walk. They are more concerned with how easy you will follow and you will allow them to control you. This is done simply because Satan needs this one. Why? He needs to get the entire world marked as his subjects so as to defeat Christ. One problem is the elect cannot be deceived. They will know what, is in the trying to do, uh, what he is in the trying to do and we will proclaim from the rooftops. The Vatican has been shouting for years that all religions must come together as one. The word of God is plain. It states that we cannot join together with those that do not embrace truth. Amos 3, verse 3, quote, Can two walk together except they be agreed? Unquote. And 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 to 17, Quote, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion has light with darkness? Therefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, said the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. End quote. Yet Rome openly declares you need to join with her for world peace. And to further prove she cares not for Jesus, for the gospel itself, I have a page on my website entitled Rome Says Jesus Not Needed. So when you look up in the index on the page of Remnant of God on Earth, you will find this. In the Catholicism, <coughs> uh, in the Catholicism exposed section of the menu. On this page, I share numerous quotes from the Vatican as well as Protestant leaders where they boldly proclaim Jesus is not needed to gain heaven. When the Vatican or its representatives are speaking to local churches, they will most assuredly say you need Jesus to gain heaven. But when they speak to the world at large via the media, they speak of another message. They say such things as this. Cardinal Francis Arinzi, who is considered a possible successor to Pope John Paul II, has denied Jesus is the only way to heaven. You can read that in the Dallas Morning News from uh, 3rd of, uh, 20th of March 1999. The Pope said that an audience, quote, all of the just earth, including those who ignore Christ and his church, unquote, were, quote, called upon to build the kingdom of God, unquote. Electronic Telegraph, uh, 8th of December 2000. The Vatican City 
Yes. And their relations with Jews, Christians must recognize that Jews do not have to convert in order to be saved. A top Vatican official said. Uh, that's from CNS, 7th uh, of November 2002. The Vatican is the ultimate political entity on earth. Now let that sink in for a moment, yes? The Vatican is the ultimate political entity on earth. Not spiritual, political. What you see them doing here is no different than what the Roman taught, uh, taught politicians have been doing all along. It's the same method a campaigning official uses to gather votes for office. For example, when William Jefferson Clinton was running for the governor's office in Arkansas, he was anti-abortion. That won him the election. When he was running for president, he became pro-abortion and even initiated partial birth abortion. The Pope and his representatives will use this same deceit to get the masses to their agenda. And when someone questions it in their local church, their parish priest or Protestant minister will lie and say they don't agree with what the media stated and then spin back the truth to fit your ears. We cannot deny the documented statements. They are right there in black and white. And we cannot deny whatever we hear when we confront those that speak such lies on a local level. Craftiness and deceit is a major tool in these last days. The great overriding feature of the entire system of the Antichrist, the New World Order, is blatant deceit. In fact, New World Order writers boast of their planned deceptions because they are arrogantly believe that the great majority of this world's population is too stupid and lazy to know what is best for them. Only the New World Order planners know what is best for the world, and they have determined that they can achieve their goals only by deliberate deception of the poor masses. This quote was taken from Bill Cooper's wonderful, wonderful book, Behold the Pale Horse, pages 215 to 252. I think that most of our listeners are familiar with Bill Cooper and uh, his work, and uh, maybe they haven't recognized or they have not recognized the Cooper was killed the night of 5th of November 2001. Just five months after he warned the American people with a live broadcast on his hot radio, hour of the time, radio show on shortwave, the 28th of June of 2001, that he said there will be an event taking place in the United States of America that will shake the Americans upside down and they will blame Osama bin Laden for it. So when then 9-11 in 2001 happened, they actually tried to kill him that day, but because of all the attention that was there for the other things, they chose to take another date and they took the 5th of November. And what is the 5th of November telling anybody who studies scripture and the history of the Protestant churches? That was the night of the gunpowder plot where a Jesuit called Guy Fawkes tried to blow up the Protestant government of Great Britain, of England at that time. And they chose that night to shoot Bill Cooper 13 times in the night of 5th of November. So there are not so many real, true American patriot heroes. Even though I'm not an American, I have my deep respect for Bill Cooper and his research and the work that he did. And also, just leaning on on Bill Cooper, there are audio files out there on the Internet. You can get all the audio files of his hot broadcasts. And there are some 43 broadcasts dealing with the subject of Mystery Babylon. And when you've listened to that and studied that, you will understand even much more about the Roman Catholic Church too. But okay, I continue now from Vatican City, from AP, Associated Press. 
Quote, Pope John Paul II rang in the new year on Thursday with a renewed call for peace in the Middle East and Africa and the creation for a new world order based on respect for the dignity of man and equality among nations. Stop right there. Yes. The Antichrist of the Bible calling for world peace. By peace he shall destroy many, right? That's what the New World Order is all about. A, a false peace. War is there, peace, there, peace is war. There, pardon? War is peace, and peace is war. Yeah, yeah. What does the Bible say? What does God say? There will be no peace until the Prince of Peace comes. So if this Pope brazenly stands in front of the world and calls for peace, and puts itself out as the harbinger of peace in the world. There is a perfect dis- uh, demonstration of the craftiness and deceit of the papacy. And it is the wars of the world that are fomented by the Roman Catholic Church through the Jesuit order and for the, for the pre... Anybody knows anything about the history of the Vatican, the history of the popes knows that their most proficient ability is to foment wars and then to prosper from both sides of the conflict, and then be at the table of armistice to dis- determine the outcome of the war and, the, and to determine the terms of the peace. The papacy foments the wars, finances the wars, profits from the wars, and then profits from the armistice. The Vatican is the warmonger of the world. It is no, That was known by the Protestant reformers. It was known by the Huguenots, the Hussites, the Waldenses, all the true Bible-believing Christians throughout history, that it was the Vatican who fomented the wars. It was the Vatican who financed the wars. It was the Vatican who rose up the Crusades. It was the Vatican, the papacy, that benefited throughout all the wars. All the wars are fought for the benefit of the papacy. And yet the world is clueless as to why all the wars, 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 and rumors of wars. Why? Because the world doesn't will, or will not accept the truth, the biblical, historical, and prophetic truth that the papacy is the Antichrist of the Bible and that he's, he's on the earth to conquer the earth we're, we're, we're never, we're never uh, commanded to conquer anything. The true body of Christ is the body of peace because we worship the Prince of Peace. We don't foment war. We expose the, the bloodthirsty papacy. And this idea that the Pope now, who has pitted the... the, the, the uh, uh, the Palestinians against the Jews and the Jews against the Palestinians by creating this nation, by creating the nation state of Israel in the first place, is somehow going to be the harbinger of peace to that region for one purpose and one purpose only, so that the Pope can be the Messiah of both the Palestinians and the Jews. And uh, the Vatican has coveted. Uh, Temple Mount has coveted Jerusalem ever since the Crusades. The papacy, when it stands in front of the world and calls for peace in the Middle East, should outrage any thinking man. The trouble is there aren't many thinking men in the world. There aren't many who read their Bibles. There aren't many who understand history. And uh, it's, it's, it's an outrage that the papacy could stand in front of the world and call for peace in the Middle East without being uh, jeered by every nation on the planet. Professor Jagan dialectic I use there. Yeah. And um, there, there's a quote, I don't know from who that comes, but uh, the quote that I once read was, the church is more prosperous in wartime than it is in peacetime. 
Yes, that was a Roman Catholic prelate. I wish I could remember his name, too, but yeah, he said I, that, that. Yes. Let me just look me up. But yes. I know that he said that. Yes. So it is in the best interest of the church to have wars. All around Without the war, the church can't advance her agenda in the world. That's an open admission by the Roman Catholic Church. Right. So. And when you read this... Um, Associated Press article again, a part of this, where the Pope speaks and says, the New World Order based on respect for the dignity of man. I only ask, where is Christ in this? Nowhere. Nowhere to be found. And that is exactly what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. We don't need Christ, we only need men. And that brings forth all this humanism that is taught um, lately all over the world. It's all about humans, and it's all about Gaia, all about the world. It's never about Christ. And it was the papacy, it was the papacy and the Jesuits who fomented 9-11, and and William Cooper knew about it, and he tried to tell the American people about it, and he did tell the American people about it. And as a response, Jesuit trained Bill Clinton uh, declared that Bill Cooper was the most dangerous man in America. Why? Because he, folks, yeah. yeah, because he knew the truth. Yeah. And he was telling the American people in a forum that was widely listened to. And uh, while I may or may not agree with every, because I haven't read his book yet, uh, admittedly, but uh, I have listened to many of his recordings and uh, he he had his finger on the pulse of the global deceiver in the world, the papacy. He was on the march to expose the Roman Catholic Church on a forum that would have been widely listened to, widely read, widely understood. And he was the biggest threat to the Pope's New World Order. And they killed him. They went out of their way to kill him. And, uh, and they had his replacement waiting in the wings, Alex Jones, the biggest <laughs> deceiver, the greatest shill for the Vatican on, on Internet radio. And he should be exposed for the fraud that he is, the papal fraud that he is. Okay, let me come in there, please. On my YouTube channel, Jogna66, I have uploaded a 45 or 50-minute long video of the radio show that Bill Cooper did on the 28th of June, 2001, where he warned the American people about that there will be an event and that Osama bin Laden is behind that. And I also have uploaded a five-part series where Bill Cooper exposes Alex Jones for what he is. So when you go to my channel and look into my videos, you will find that when you look at them, because there are 345 videos on there right now, but it's not so hard to find that. And then you can listen to that for yourself. And yeah, um, Alex Jones is part of Operation Mockingbird of the CIA. Yes, indeed. And is exactly the mainstream of the so-called truther media, of the so-called alternative media. Mainstream there is Alex Jones. Nothing but fear-mongering and things that you don't know about him are things like he got married to his Jewish wife by Tex Mars, and his father-in-law is a knight of Malta, controlling him. He never speaks about the Jesuits. He never speaks about the Roman Catholic Church. And, you know, Alex Jones brings out a lot of truth when he does some documentaries when you read some documents about things that is going on in the coming police state of the United States of America. I do not deny that. But with people like Alex Jones, you have to be vigilant because it is not what they say that you have to analyze. It is what they don't say that you have to pay attention to. That is correct. And Alex Jones doesn't say a lot of things. You know, I heard somebody uh, say that uh, you can do a word search on all the articles on his website, Prison Planet, 
And and uh, if you have a particular topic that you want to read about uh, in one of Alex Jones' past programs, you can type in a word and do a search on it and collect all the articles uh, that deal with that particular subject matter. But if you type in the word Jesuits or Knights of Malta, it returns no no documents. Your search is just eliminated. It doesn't even acknowledge your search. And if this is the most blatant and outward demonstration of Alex Jones' duplicity with the Jesuits and the Knights of Malta that there could be. And I even tested it myself. I went to his website, and I put, did a word search for Knights of Malta, and there were no returns. My search was deleted. It wasn't even uh, 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 accepted. It was just it just reset itself. And I don't know if it's still the case, but if anybody wishes, they can go to Alex Jones' website, uh, Prison Planet, do a word search for Jesuits or Knights of Malta, and see if he's still conducting the same kind of of uh, duplicity, uh, duplicious cover up of the Vatican's role in uh, in this new world order. But it, those those are subjects that he just won't tolerate uh, discussed on his program. It's it's. Uh, He's a shill for the Vatican. He can't be trusted. Now, of course, he wouldn't have his listenership if there weren't a great deal of truth, verifiable truth. And there is a, a great deal of verifiable truth. But the only, the, only, the only deception is, is any link between the New World Order and the papacy and, and the orders that serve the papacy, like the Knights of Malta, the Knights of Columbus, the Jesuits, Opus Dei, and Freemasonry. And all these other things, uh, he is uh, a despicable, a despicable deceiver, disinformation. And uh, I, I'm proud and pleased that God has blessed me with the fearlessness that Alex Jones could only envy. The fearlessness to put the finger right on the trouble spot in this world. Vatican City, Rome. The woman that rides the scarlet-colored beast in Revelation chapter 17. That city, that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. That's Vatican City. It's the papacy. And Alex Jones would choke on those words. He's to be condemned by the strongest possible terms. He knows the truth. And he's keeping it from the American people. If Alex Jones knew the truth and could tell it to the American people, we could stop this new world order. He's got enough listeners that would really make a difference. But instead, he's a shill for the Vatican. He's ought to be, he ought to be universally condemned. Well, I couldn't agree more, Tom. And I just want to finish with um, saying you don't bite the hand that feeds you. Yes, and uh, 25% of his listeners are Roman Catholics. He wouldn't want to offend them, would he? Uh, probably not, even though that he states in the video that he is one of the descendants that came over with the Mayflower. <laughs> Doesn't pass muster. I, 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 I saw him uh, saying that in one of his shows. There was a video Alain Lamont made about the exposition of Alex Jones, and uh, there, was, there was that in uh, the... But okay, going back to the article that I just read, where the last one was called, Pope Calls for a New World Order. This is a sad fact of society today, my friends. If it isn't Hollywood causing millions to become couch potatoes, it's the Roman Catholic controlled pharmacies pumping them with so many drugs that most people today look to the other way, uh, look to the other guy, to get off the couch and do something. Most agree things have gotten so bad that something needs to be done about it, but no one is willing to get off their backside to do it. I have literally hundreds of pages on my site dedicated to the Vatican's One World Government Church, deceptions alone. In fact, there's a section on the site that has gotten so huge due to all the articles on this topic that I had to shut it down. I simply could not keep up with all the facts coming in on a daily basis. So 
So I stopped posting the articles of the Roman International Criminal Court System that we were speaking about, the ITCC from Anna, from uh, Anna, uh, Bennett, was it, I guess, uh, was initiated. I knew it was only a few months before the United Religions Initiative would come to be, and so it did. Plus, I figured the hundreds of articles showing every aspect of the trickery played out before governing officials to make the New World Order attractive were enough to convince even the hardened skeptic. Two crafty lies were used by Rome to get those two global entities realized. Truth is, they actually used the same lie both times. The first one is this. Rome used the quote-unquote peace and safety lie that 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 3 prophetically speaks of to get the Roman international court set up. They convinced the powers that be that if, uh, that be that if a global court was set up, all the world would be as one, and peace would be realized. And the second point is, Rome again used the peace and safety lie to get the United Religions uh, ratified as well. They once more used craftiness and deceit to convince the leaders of all nations as well as churches that if a global church was brought forth, everyone would happily join, and world peace would be the end result. So we all take each other by the hands, dance in circles, and sing Kumbaya. The evangelic yes. bellicals of how you call them, Tom. Yes. And I, I have another example of, of papal craft and deceit. This information's come to me rather recently. Uh, of course, you know, uh, Yerk, that the World Bank is another Vatican institution that covers up, covers up for the papacy. We've talked about the UN and, and other, Vatican, uh, another Vatican agencies, uh, government agencies. But the, Vatican's is, the Vatican is in control of world finance, too. And, of course, uh, you know, it's just they cover – they uh, control the currency. They can control the people, and they can control the governments of the world because the governments of the world are so dependent upon uh, this, this Roman system of finance. Uh, but uh, I wonder if your listeners have heard of a woman by the name of Karen Hudis. Her last name is spelled H-U-D-E-S. Uh, she was the principal, uh, uh, the principal legal authority of the World Bank. She was in charge of the legal team that operates full time at the World Bank to make sure that it is compliant with national and international law, and it's also part of her job to. Uh, uh, ensure that there's no corruption at the World Bank. I mean, after all, for it to have any credibility, it has to have its own legal team to make sure that it stays on the straight and narrow and actually serves the purpose that the papacy intended for it to serve. Well, Karen Hudis uh, discovered uh, widespread corruption at the World Bank, and it was her, it was. You know, all this corruption was falling on her lap because she was the one responsible to make sure that there was no corruption at the bank. And uh, uh, she uncovered this corruption, and then she uncovered the World Bank's efforts to cover it up. And, uh, of course, no one in the mainstream media, since the mainstream media, you, you mentioned Operation Mockingbird, how the CIA has taken over the media in this country. And uh, uh, so she gets no mainstream media attention. So she's gone off on her own, going to uh, uh, second and third, uh, you know, alternative media sources to expose first the corruption and then the cover-up and she's even resorted to talking to the governors of the state of the individual states in the United States. You know what she's discovered? She's discovered that the Jesuits control the World Bank and that they are misappropriating the money for the World Bank. She also has discovered that the Jesuits control the uh, the uh, Federal Reserve Banks, not just in America, but in other countries, and is diverting 
diverting uh, uh, money for Jesuit endeavors. She went so far as to say, now this is going to blow your mind, but you can go and watch her videos on YouTube, her interviews on, on YouTube. She says that 60% of the tax dollars that Americans pay to the IRS goes directly to the Jesuit order. She says that in public. Now, now Karen Hudis is no small potato. She was the chief legal counsel for the World Bank. She oversaw a, 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 an entire team of lawyers at the World Bank whose responsibility was to keep the World Bank above board. She discovered fraud and deceit. She discovered misappropriation of funds. She discovered corruption at the highest levels of the World Bank. She went public, as public as she could, means that the world, that the uh, the mainstream, the world mainstream media won't won't, won't touch her with a ten foot pole. She's doing the best she can to get the word out, and the word is the Roman Catholic Church controls the World Bank. The Jesuits control the World Bank. The Jesuits control the Federal Reserve Bank. And the IRS is simply the tax collector for the Vatican. And 60% of our tax dollars go directly to the Jesuit order. She's saying that publicly. Now, now people are going to try, you know, people are going to ask, well, how come she's still alive? How come they haven't killed her? That's a good question. That is a really good question. And I'd love to get Karen Hudis on Inquisition Update. As soon as I can get back online, I'm going to beat her door down. I want her on Inquisition Update, and I want her to tell my listeners to their faces uh, on my program what in the world is going on. And I'm the one that can ask her the really tough questions and get Karen Hudis to spill her guts. But uh, you talk about craftiness and deceit of the papacy. They control the financial institutions of the world. Every bank in this country gets its money from the Federal Reserve Bank. The Federal Reserve Bank is a Jesuit bank. The national debt of the United States and all the national debts of all the nations are owed to the Vatican. And that's how the Vatican, the Pope, Antichrist Francis I, can walk right into the Congress of the United States and dictate to our government what it'll do and what it won't do. We have one. We, well, we have one member of the of the Rothschilds who admitted, "Give me control of a nation's money, and I care not who makes its laws." Right. And that Rothschild is a Jesuit agent. They were all the Rothschilds were trained in Jesuit universities in uh, France, one in particular, the Lycee Louis Le Grand University, a Jesuit university, that's where they got their craft of, of, of turning paper and ink into gold. You talk about the, the global uh, alchemists of the world. What better way? I mean, alchemy is, is said to be a, a, a science where they can take base metals and, and, and turn it into gold. Well, that's just a diversion. The true alchemists in the world can simply take plain paper and ink and turn it into gold. And that's what the Federal Reserve Bank does. It's not money. Every Federal Reserve note is a note. It's a loan. The currency that we, we pass back and forth is... Lit when you go to a bakery and you buy a loaf of bread... That bread has worth. A farmer had to raise the wheat. A baker had to, had to bake it into bread. It, it can sustain your life. It's worth gold, some amount of gold. But what you hand them in return is debt. Every dollar, every Federal Reserve note is a note, a debt. And it makes us all thieves. And Karen Eudis knows this. And she's exposing that the entire financial system of this world is controlled by the papacy. And guess who's got all the gold? The papacy! They've taken paper and ink and turned it into gold. And the Vatican owns the gold of the world. You talk about craftiness and deceit, you can't get more crafty or deceit than that. 
Karen Hudes, K-A-R-E-N-H-U-D-E-S. Just type her name into you into YouTube and watch her videos. Listen to what she says. Absolutely, Tom. I have something to add here that uh, maybe all will be interesting for some people. You know that the American and actually the world financial system is based on debt. People never ask, even though they have in, in the basic economy classes, it's told, wherever there's debt, there's also the, the funds. I mean, the opposite. There's the, uh, the positive side to the debt. So when we all live in debt, who's got all the money? Who's got all the wealth? Nobody ever asked that. You know that the United States of America alone is in debt for, I don't know, something about $16 trillion or whatever. So when that is all the debt, where is all, uh, when that is all the debt, where is all the money going to? Who has it? And then they point always to the Rothschild and say, yeah, it's the Jews that handle all that stuff. Well, if you want to understand that, that the Rothschilds are just a front organization for the Jesuits, you have to read Tapper Saucy's book, Rulers of Evil, page 160 and page 161. I will not quote that right here, but you can look it up for yourself, where <coughs> it is stated that uh, in the uh, Encyclopedia Judaica, the Rothschilds are mentioned as the um, guardians of the Vatican treasury. And when we are speaking about the World Bank, there's also another interesting bank that uh, should come up here, and that is the BIS, the Bank of International Settlements, that is uh, seated in Zurich in Switzerland, and that the Rothschilds own. And all the Rothschilds are Knights of Malta, or an affiliate other Roman Catholic Vaticanical Papal Knight Order. Yes, there are also Freemasons. There are also Freemasons, but also yes. Knights of Malta. Yes. And the Knights of Malta are in the, uh, at the top controlled by the Jesuits. So, it's not the Jews, it's not the Zionists, it's the Gentiles, because we are living in the time of the Gentiles. There you go. <clears throat> I will continue reading now. Um, with this article that I was stuck on. So I'm going to continue. It doesn't end there either. Rome also uses deceit and craftiness to get people to see her as a moral, moral authority. However, when you dig deep and pull back the curtain, you see all the decadence of the most evil entity ever known to man. An organization so evil that over 500 million Christians have been recorded to have lost their lives at the hands of these bloodthirsty wolves. This is why the Lord sent them seven last plagues. In fact, plague number one and three specifically state it is because they are bloodthirsty that the Lord gives them blood to drink. Revelation 16, verses 3 through 6 reads, quote, And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured, poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of the waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. For they shed the blood of the saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. End quote. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord. They receive blood to drink because they, first, they thirst for it. The Lord is only giving them what they want. I go into far more detail about the seven last plagues in the index on the website and the prophecy section of the menu. It's pretty amazing to see how, much, how each plague is not only understood why they will come, but how as well. One thing really amazes me about the craftiness of this church uh, is how they admitted on March 12, 2000, and Pope John Paul II's mea culpa, 
to the entire world in its globally televised manner that the Roman Catholic Church did, in fact, kill all those Christians during what history records as the Dark Ages. Yet, the Roman Catholic Church remains the largest church on earth, sporting over 1.2 billion members. That is the ultimate testimony of craftiness and deceit. I'm just going to stop here because this is so important. March 12, 2000, John Paul II, on a globally televised broadcast, stands there, says, Mea culpa, and he's been forgiven for the death of at least 500 million people in the time of the Dark Ages, the time between 538 and 1798 that we often talked about. I mean, is that it? We just stand there, say, my fault, and that's it. If you are a member of the Roman Catholic Church and you can accept that, what withholds you from going out on the street and kill anybody that you see there? Because you, know, you just say, oh, I'm sorry, it doesn't matter anymore. That's what he brings about with this mea culpa. And I don't, I don't understand that he has gotten away with it. 500 million people, saints, Bible-believing Christians, and a lot of other people, of course, on the way, that the Roman Catholic Church wasted during the 1260 years of reign in the Dark Ages. And all it takes for the Pope to stand there as a good man before the world today is to stand there in front of a television camera and say, my fault? Okay, a world that accepts that is not really a world worth living in, is it? It makes me wonder what it will take to wake up the people of the world. If the people of the world were awake and listened to that so-called mea culpa, that admission of guilt of the papacy, you would think that there was, a, if there were any Protestant, Protestantism left in the world, that every Roman Catholic church in the world would have been razed to the ground. And by the way, the, the so-called mea culpa that John Paul II issued went on to lay the blame upon over-enthusiastic Roman Catholics. He blamed it on his own people. In, in, in one breath apologizing and in the other breath shifting the blame to individual Roman Catholics. And, it, and not a word was said about the untold millions of lives that have been claimed directly or indirectly by the papacy in the modern era. No apology was made for World War I. No apology was made for World War II. No apology was made for all the papal proxy wars, the Vietnam War, the Korean War, all the other conflicts of the world to advance the papacy's new world order. Not one word mentioned. Why? He didn't have to mention them. Nobody comprehends that the wars of the world are fought for the benefit of the papacy. Well, it's time for the world to know the truth. John Paul II made a very placid apology for what the world has since forgotten. The Dark Ages, the slaughter of the Huguenots, the Hussites, the Waldenses, the, the, all the slain of the earth. But he stopped sh just short of telling the world that the killing of the Roman Catholic Church continues unabated even to this day. And the world is deceived, grossly deceived. Well, that God would give her nothing but blood to drink. That day is fast approaching. I hope to see it with my own eyes. Thank you, Tom. Now, I will continue reading now. No one will ever be able to convince me that all those loyal Catholics out there agree that it was okay to kill millions of people. Yet they remain members of that church still to this day. What's worse, they stay members even... <clears throat> Uh, 
even after their priests have been taught molesting their very own children, and even after the statistics revealed that Roman Catholic priests are dying of AIDS 11 times greater than any other group in the USA. If any other entity or organization on earth admitted to such a hellish act, they would be shut down immediately. Case in point, look at Hitler. To this day, he is considered the most evil man ever to grace the face of the earth. Yet he has, opened, he has only been exposed as the mass murderer of only 6 million Jews. The records show that Rome killed over 83 times more people than Hitler ever did. And they are now called the moral authority and elected leader of the one world court system, as well as one world church. If this is not a prophetic method for craftiness and deceit, then else what could possibly stand there. And uh, lately thanks to the Roman Catholic through our commercial called The Passion of Christ. One can see that even the Protestant churches of today are falling for the deceit of Rome. Not long ago, all Protestant leaders have been openly documented as proclaiming Rome the home of Antichrist. However, today all protesting faiths agree the Pope is the moral leader of the world, only one that has the satanic ability of craftiness and deceit Daniel speaks of in his prophecy can turn such graphically blunt tables as this. This prophecy is most assuredly fulfilled by this church in Rome. That continues characteristic number 13. Well, like I say, Nicholas is very thorough in his research. It's hard to add anything more, but do, let me just close by saying uh, that deception and deceit describes, it, it's the definition of the church of deception. I think the few points that we read here today contain so much knowledge and also wisdom <laughs> that the people who have listened to this will have a lot to think about in the future to really understand it and because they have the link they can even read further and convince themselves that uh, we are saying here nothing else than what is already stated in the Bible in the word of God so um, I'd like to see Tom, do you have some closing remarks for our broadcast today? Yeah. I would conclude by saying futurism is a lie. If you believe in a future Antichrist, you've been deceived. Now, don't be offended by that. I was once deceived, too. I was once a futurist. For 50 years of my life, I was a futurist. I believed in a future 70th week of Daniel. That's a lie. Jesus fulfilled the 70th week, and in the midst of that week, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease by giving up himself a lamb, a ransom for many. The 70th week of Daniel is over. It was over 2,000 years ago, perfectly and completely fulfilled by the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Sorry, can I interrupt you here for a second? Yes. You did a wonderful, wonderful broadcast some time ago when you were still talking on Laurie's broadcast radio about this topic. In the three-hour broadcast, more than one hour, you spoke about the 70th week of Daniel and how it has been fulfilled. I, on my channel, Jogla 66, sorry, have a video made not so far ago, I think it's three or four videos ago, where I also covered this subject. And I would love it, Tom, if you agreed to come back to the show next time and we will not continue on the characteristics of the Antichrist, but that you will explain in the same way that you did in that wonderful radio show on Loris Broadcast, Block Talk Radio over there, to our listeners the deception of the futurist agenda and the actual fulfillment of the 70th week prophecy of Daniel 
by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, I consider myself blessed by God to be able to repeat that uh, that study. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. So I think um, we have read now all the points we come uh, until the 13th point, which is exactly in the half because we are talking about 26 points. So we will continue this broadcast, of course, but like I said, I just invited Tom to do a broadcast on the futurism agenda and the fulfillment of the 70th week prophecy of Daniel in our next broadcast. So I will see with Michael when there will be a next broadcast scheduled, and uh, we will put that out there on the site that you can see that in time, and we will put the title right that you know what it is all about. And I want to thank you, Tom, very much for being here today, to being here the last time that we spoke about, and of course, to join me in uh, the next broadcast uh, called uh, Conversation with Jogler 66 on the topic of identifying the futurism agenda and how Christianity got hijacked by this evil craftiness work the Roman Catholic Church put into work to deceive the whole world, as stated already in the Bible. And I want to thank uh, our Heavenly Father and the Holy Ghost and Jesus Christ that this broadcast today was made possible, that we could get our word out, our truth out. This is called Nothing But The Truth, and you can measure all the things that we say here against the Bible and can approve it and can check it. And when you catch us on a lie because we are not all knowing, uh, then it will maybe be just because we speak out of ignorance and no man is perfect. But I want to thank our Father for this wonderful broadcast that we had today. Thank you, Tom, for attending here, coming by, and uh, thank you for agreeing to come to a future broadcast. And uh, with this, I will go off the line. Thank you all, and God bless you all, and bye-bye. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. So, yeah, it was a great show, very good show. So, um, yeah, uh, Wednesday night, got a show going on at 9.30, if anybody's interested. be talking with Pastor George... Uh, Middleton Jr. Yeah, it should be interesting. We're going to talk about uh, NLP, the use of neuro-linguistic programming in religion and in society, what's going on as far as in the Internet and YouTube, and the connection with the Jesuits and, um, and um, spiritual formation, exercises, that kind of thing. So it should be interesting. Anyways, thank you, gentlemen. Um, and hopefully we can have a show soon and then talk about what we just discussed. So with that, we'll call it a show and take care, everybody.